Welcome back to your vocational nursing courses. I hope you had a lovely break. This course is LVN110B, Pharmacology for Vocational Nursing Part 2 at the College of the Redwoods Del Norte campus. I look forward to what we'll learn together this semester, but let's take a quick review of where we've been. Let's review some of the concepts we covered in LVN110A. That was the Pharmacology for Vocational 1 course that you had in the fall semester. You'll remember from that course that drugs can be classified as traditional, biologics, or natural alternatives. Our traditional drug therapies are those that are chemically produced in the laboratory. They're routinely used by healthcare providers. Biologics are those that are naturally produced either by the body itself or animal cells and sometimes in microorganisms. These things include things like hormones and vaccines. They're also routinely used by healthcare providers. Our natural author alternative therapies are those that are naturally produced. This includes our herbs, extracts, vitamins, minerals, or other dietary supplements. These are sometimes used depending on the comfort and the needs of the patient, as well as the healthcare provider's comfort with ordering those. You'll also remember that drugs can be classified as prescription, meaning that they require a prescriber with a license and distribution from a licensed pharmacy, or they can be over-the-counter, OTC, which those drugs are available in places like your health food store. Your local pharmacy does carry over-the-counter, as well as some of your large or some of your um, regular shopping places like Walmart or Safeway. You will remember from 110A that drug regulations were created to protect the public from charlatans, from selling a couple bottles of Dr. Good, right? And that drug testing standards and drug labeling have become more stringent within those regulations as well. How do we get new drugs? You'll recall that there are stages for approval of drugs that are through the F Food and Drug Administration. You'll want to review the four stages to FDA approval in your textbook. The first step being preclinical investigation. The second, our clinical investigation that includes our clinical phase trials one, two, and three. And then the new drug application with review by the FDA, as well as post-marketing studies which are sometimes more significant because they lead to the information that tells us about patients that maybe the drugs aren't tested on, those that are young, those that are older, and those that are maybe not as healthy as the test subjects. You'll wanna take a few minutes to remember that drugs can be classified in different ways. There's the pharmacologic classification or by mechanism of action. So that's when we classify drugs by how they work pharmacologically. They can also be classified by therapeutic classification. You'll remember that this is most commonly how they're classified. By how do we use them? What is their therapeutic usefulness for us? What about drug nomenclature? You'll remember there are three names. The trade name, that's the one assigned by the drug company for marketability. It's usually pretty easy to remember and sometimes can point to the action. For example, mucinex, mucus, mucus X, or X, be gone. Right? So mucinex, a generic name, that's the name assigned to the U.S. Adopted Name Council, or by the Adopted U.S. Name Council. It's usually less complex, but easier to remember than the chemical name. And our mucinex generic name is guaifenesin. Then there's the chemical name. That's the name assigned using the standardized nomenclature of the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. And you can see what that structure is there. Thank you, but I'll stick to either the trade name or the generic name. <laughs> so are there any differences? Well, you remember that typically the brand name and the generic name, the generic drugs um, are the same, except for the price and that the pharmaceutical company that first creates or discovers that drug determines the price of that drug during the first 17 years due to that company's right to exclusivity in the marketing of the drug. But they've paid a big fee for these clinical trials and they've done all this work. So recouping some of that funding is important. But can there be real differences between the trade brand and the generic brand? 
Well, typically they're identical dosages. That's because we want to make it consistent for the providers that are ordering the drugs. But the drug formulations are not necessarily identical. There could be a carrier or a component chemically that changes it just a little bit. And when it does that, it changes the bioavailability. You'll remember that the bioavailability is the physiological ability to reach of that drug to reach the target cells and then produce the desired effect. So anything that affects either the absorption or distribution or metabolism of the drug can certainly affect the drug action. So when we're thinking about bioavailability, we are measuring how long it takes the drug to exert its effect. So it's, a, it's actually a pretty crude measure, but sometimes it matters. Let me give you an example. If your patient's having a heart attack, and we know that a trade name drug works very quickly, and a generic drug of the same structure takes five minutes longer than the brand name drug to produce it as that effect, it would certainly make a difference, wouldn't it? But if the generic medication for, say, example, arthritis, takes 45 minutes to act compared with the brand name drug that only takes 40 minutes, probably doesn't really matter whether the trade name or the generic name is prescribed. So we have to think about that as we're looking at our patients and monitoring them for the therapeutic effect. Remember that from LVN110A, that there are drug schedules. We have our DEA drug schedule. Those are schedule one, two, three, four, and five, with drug schedule one being that highest potential for abuse. These are things that have high physical dependence like heroin, LSD, ecstasy, things that do not have, <clears throat> excuse me, do not typically have a place in medicine. Then we have our schedule two. They have a high potential for abuse, a high potential for physical and psychological dependence. These are things like hydromorphone, methadone, our methamphetamine, for example, Ritalin, right, Co uh, codeine, those problem, uh, those people that have a problem with the addiction, we want to be sure that we're careful with these. Um, it also includes drugs like phenobarbital, amibarbital, then we have our class three. These have moderate abuse potential and physical dependence. These are things like our benzophetamine, ketamine, our anabolic steroids. They have a high psychological dependence. Our level or schedule four drugs have a lower potential for abuse and physical dependence. These are things like Alprazolam, clonazepam, you'll remember the lambs and the pams, right? And then our Schedule 5, these are the lowest. These are things like our cough preparations that do not contain more than 200 milligrams of codeine per, per 100 milliliters. Then we have our pregnancy categories, A, B, C, D, and X. Now you will remember from LVN110A that that is being replaced by the pregnancy lactation, excuse me, by the new pregnancy lactation labeling rules. This new rule goes into effect in 2020. So please be sure that you're familiar with the categories 8.1 for pregnancy, 8.2 lactation, and 8.3 female and males of reproductive potential. LVN110A taught us about adverse drug events. Remember, our major goal is to limit these, and we do this by reviewing the rights of drug administration and the three checks of drug administration every single time we administer any medication. Adverse drug events can also be precipitated by patient compliance or not com really non-compliance. We want to make sure that we document and we use appropriate abbreviations, approved abbreviations, and that we're familiar with the systems of measurement and how to convert those, our metric, apothecary, and household measurements. 
within this prevention of adverse drug events with our major goal in mind, which is to limit them or prevent them, we run across these minimum standards. These are the very minimum standards that we have when we think about administering medications. We always review the orders. We review the allergies on the chart. We wash our hands and glove if indicated. We want to use aseptic technique for both medication preparation and administration. Always identify the patient using at least two identifiers according to your facility or agency policy and procedure. Review the allergies again at the bedside. Make sure that you know if there is a combination drug that your patient's not allergic to one of the medications that's contained within that combination. Ensure that needed supplies are already there. They're present at the time of administration. For example, your cup of water, applesauce, whatever you might need to make sure that you do not have to leave the room with that medication. Educate the patient on the medication you're administering. You should know the purpose, how you're going to give it, what it's for. Be prepared for their questions. Position your patient appropriately based on the route and never leave unattended medications at the bedside. Document according to your facility policy and procedure and be sure that you include the response to the medication. If we're giving, for example, a medication for blood pressure, for high blood pressure, I should say, what would we expect? We would expect that we would be monitoring that patient's blood pressure to make sure that that medication is still working or is working as well as we hoped. We can't review LVN110A without talking about the nursing process. And you will remember ADPI, assessment where we collect our data, organize our data, our diagnosis, we analyze the data and identify nursing diagnoses and the collaborative problems. Remember as an LVN, you are to choose the appropriate nursing diagnosis from the NANDA approved list. Then we will plan by prioritizing those problems identifying measurable outcomes, setting those goals with the patient. Remember, patient compliant is an important part of what we do, of what we work within, rather. Select our nursing interventions. Those are always what we are going to do for the patient. Document that in your plan of care. Then implementation is carrying out those nursing orders and documenting the nursing care and the client's response to that care. Then we will evaluate Working with the registered nurse will resolve, continue, and revise the current plan of care. We always are going to be monitoring for client outcomes. Is the goal that the patient will do met or not met? So as we travel through LVM 110B, make sure that if you have any questions that you post them or call or text or email. I've put up here the time frames of when I will respond. Text usually within the hour. Calls usually before I go to sleep at night. If it's able to wait, you could post it in the discussion forum. I will give 24 hours except on weekends or holidays. And then email usually takes me 48 hours unless you go through the discussion or the Canvas system. Then we'll get to it more quickly. But I look forward to a great semester. And as I said, welcome back. Let's do this.